You may be one of those joining us for the first time because we have had phenomenal growth on new platforms over the last seven days, particularly TikTok, a particularly strong showing on TikTok, more than half a million views. Uh, but for the rest of you who are used to this, fasten your seatbelts because I'm going to have to talk tough, not to you, uh, but about our leaders because we are headed firmly for disaster. Uh, the uh, proximate reason for choosing this subject to lead off my monologue this evening was that in the early hours of this morning, I paid £1.97 pence for one litre of diesel. It's a Volvo car. It's got good mileage, thank God. If it didn't, then even I would have been in serious trouble. £1.97 for a litre approximates to £8.94 per gallon. It will be within days, I suspect, at least in the filling station I attended last evening, £9 per gallon. £9 per gallon is a kick in the backside of an almost literally unbelievable 10 pounds a gallon. This is not a creed decor for my petrol bills. I can afford to pay them, though there are many people who cannot afford to buy fuel for their vehicle at that price. And those people would tend to be the very same people that require their vehicle in order to get to work, in order to carry out uh, their working duties, or who live, as I do, in places where uh, public transport is uh, a phantasm. Uh, public transport round here, you'll wait a day for a bus to come by. There is no alternative to driving for millions of people in Britain and in the United States for scores, maybe hundreds of millions of Americans. And yet the price of fuel is rising inexorably. It's going to, of course, feed into the price of everything else, because thanks to the destruction of much of our railway network, almost everything that you consume in a shop, in a restaurant, anywhere else is brought ultimately by road. If the price of traveling by road goes up, so do the prices of the goods that are traveling by road. If you add to that the shortage of essential foodstuffs that is now feeding fast through the pipeline, like wheat for one thing. Wheat is in everything. It's even in your burger, McDonald's, have burger, other brands are available, but they all contain wheat. Russia is the number one supplier of wheat in the world. Ukraine is the number two supplier of wheat in the world. For reasons which will be obvious, we'll not be eating much, if anything, of either of those two wheat fields. The price of other foodstuffs is also beginning to rocket where those foodstuffs are not themselves becoming unavailable. If you eat fish and chips out of a British fish and chip shop, and who doesn't in my country, then eat this. One in three of our fish and chip shops is set to close in the next 12 months because it will not be able to get the sunflower, which they require for their cooking oil. Where does the sunflower come from? It comes from Russia, silly. It comes from Ukraine, silly. And the price of fertilizer has rocketed. And so the shortage in the fields come next harvest is not rocket science to estimate. The price of fertilizer has rocketed because the geniuses that run the British and American governments have sanctioned Russian fertilizer. Russia is one of the biggest suppliers of fertilizer 
in the entire world. You see where I'm going here? We've got leaders that have struggled mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on our feet, not their own. They're well healed. Their feet are not in the way. The ministers, the plutocrats, the oligarchs that run Britain and America will not run short of any of the things that I have just described. But you will. You will either not be able to get essential products or you will only be able to get it at a price that you cannot afford. You'll notice that I didn't mention Russian gas. I didn't mention it perhaps because it's the most serious of all. It's not just that you need Russian gas in Europe to stay warm or at the height of the summer to stay cool. It's that every factory, workshop, mine and mill is turning on power, electric power, gas power. And the Russians are on the verge of telling us they no longer wish us to be their customers. That's because of the absurd hullabaloo about Russia's demand to be paid in its own currency for its own exports. I need to spell this out because so many people are so silly about this. If I told my gas supplier I wasn't going to pay him in pounds, I would prefer to pay him in rubles, he would laugh in my face and cut my gas off. Yet so many idiots can't grasp that if Russia wants paid for its gas in its currency, it is perfectly entitled to do so. And if you refuse, it will cut off your gas. Now, nine countries have already. Some of them have done it secretly. Others have publicly conceded that they have, like Italy, like Greece, have opened ruble accounts at the Gazprom bank and are now paying right now for their gas in rubles. One imagines that their supply will now be secure. But what about countries like Poland or, heaven forfend, Bulgaria? Poland has announced it will not pay Russia in rubles. So Russia immediately stopped its gas supply last Friday. But what does Poland intend to do? It intends to buy Russian gas from Germany. But the Russians are quite good at chess. So they've said that whatever Poland buys from Germany will be deducted from Germany's allocation of gas because it will not allow its ruble requirement to be circumvented in such a comic opera way. So if the Germans decide to sell the gas to Poland that Poland is no longer prepared to buy in rubles from Russia, then the consumers in Germany will go short. The price will rocket and the factories will stop operating. I'm going to concentrate on Germany for a minute because it's the most powerful economy in Europe and because if it heads south, then every other economy in the European Union, including our own in Great Britain, will head south with it. I'm going to give you some facts. Imported electricity costs in Germany over the last 12 months, never mind over the last four, has risen by 440.8%. The price of imported coal rose by 307.5% in Germany. Gas by 304.3% in Germany. And petroleum products by 110.3% in Germany and oil by 81.3% in 
in Germany. The German employers have said this weekend that the only way uh, that the German consumer can have enough gas next autumn and winter is if the factories begin to close. And those factories, in Germany they still have factories, they still employ thousands of people in those factories. If they start to close, will cascade millions onto the unemployment queues. Just at a time when Germany is filling up with even more refugees. What could possibly go wrong? The German economy crashing and burning whilst millions of new potential scapegoats for a rising tide of German ultra-nationalism, I'll go no further than that, begins to rise. And don't tell me it's not happening. Look at the German media. Look at the vandalism and russophobic hatred on display in Germany. Look how easily little soldier Schultz has reverted to type a peacenik with his Green Party peacenik partners are now rabid for war against Russia. 77 years exactly since the Soviet flag was hoisted over the Reichstag and Berlin lay in ruins. Its fascist dictator dead like a rat in a basement in the Reich Chancellery bunker. 77 years, that's all. There's people watching this that are more than 77 years old. My mother, for one of them. There are many people like me that grew up in the shadow of the cataclysmic events of the Second World War, who know that fascism didn't arise in Germany out of thin air. It arose out of a set of material conditions which Western idiot governments had themselves helped to pave. Pave the way to the rise of fascism, the Holocaust, and the Second World War. You see where I'm going with this. When you're led by idiots, as we then were and are again now, it's perfectly possible, even for the well-intentioned, to end up objectively, whether willingly or unwillingly, providing support, material support, for the rise of fascism, or as in the case of the right sector, and the Azov regiments, and Svoboda and all the other far-right factions in the Ukraine literally filling their pockets with money, stuffing their mouths with gold on the principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. I watched a stunning Netflix series in the week. It's called Turning Point, 9-11 and its aftermath. A lot of it was flim-flam, a lot of tearful Americans talking about the death of their much-cherished constitution and what a law-abiding country they used to be. Tell that to the Marines. Tell that to the Vietnamese and a hundred other people. Like the genre of Vietnam films, there's a lot of, they made us do it. Look what they made us do. But nonetheless, Turning Point is devastating because from their own mouths they describe not only the crimes that they committed but the blood and treasure which these crimes cost. 2.3 trillion dollars were spent by the United States in Afghanistan alone, in developing a kleptocracy, you see, Joe, I can say it. A kleptocracy 
that humanity has possibly never seen before. A kleptocracy that made the political puppet leaders of Afghanistan the richest men on the earth, richer than the oligarchs in the countries that were providing the money. And then, 20 years later, they were gone. And the people who'd been there 20 years before are back in power. It scarcely touches, only on the surface, of the situation in Iraq. But an equal catastrophe, perhaps of even greater global significance, occurred there. Why am I laboring that point? For this reason, we keep doing these things over and over and over again. We learn nothing. In fact, the same correspondence that talked us into the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, talked us into the catastrophe in Libya, the near-death experience in Syria, the same correspondence are talking us in deeper and deeper into a war with Russia. I saw coming, snaking up the road in Camden Town, just the other day, Andrew Marr, not half the man he used to be, not half the platform he used to have, but still on a local radio station here in London every week, expounding the same myths and the same foolishness. One more push. Ukraine just needs one more push, just needs another billion, another hundred billion, some more tanks, some more rockets, some more men and material, and the Russian bear can be vanquished. It is fantasy politics, fantasy military politics, but they're all still at it. Andrew Marr, was the man who stood in front of 10 Downing Street and told the worldwide audience then of the BBC that Mr. Tony Blair stood even taller tonight and his critics have been humbled by the fall of Baghdad. But Mr. Marr, the fall of Baghdad was not the beginning of the end, merely the end of the beginning. And the war that you supported and trumpeted for with every breath in your body is still going on, on multiple fronts all over the world. And the whole generation of fanatics radicalized by it have begotten a new generation of their own children who, I'll warrant, will grow up just as fanatical. Tony Blair never did face that war crimes tribunal, but he is being memorialized on the West End stage, a rock opera called Tony Blair is already in rehearsal.